Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's a real honor to be able to talk to you all and be invited to this conference. It's such a prestigious conference. A little daunting, though, especially because my boss is here and my boss's boss is here. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. And I think I even spotted my ex-boss in the back. <laughs> Um, originally, I was asked to talk about a study that we published about two years ago that looked at the earned income tax credits effects on abusive head trauma. For those of you who aren't familiar with abusive head trauma, it's otherwise known as shaken baby syndrome. But when I saw the title of this panel and of the conference, I thought I really should talk to you a little bit about the data that we used. So I retitled it using the Healthcare Utilization Project, which is um, known as HCUP data to evaluate policies effects on population health. Um, just 10 years ago, I did not know anything about evaluating policies and I didn't even know what kind of policies we needed to evaluate. But about 10 years ago, uh, Dr. Tom Frieden came to the CDC as our director and he shared this visual with us and at the, he was trying to explain to us what kinds of interventions would lead to population level impacts. So he organized the interventions from the smallest impact at the top to the largest impact at the bottom, and from the highest effort, individual effort at the top to the lowest individual effort at the bottom. So at the top, he put things like counseling and education, um, interventions where we tell people to eat healthy and be physically active. And from the field of violence prevention, I would put uh, parent training programs here. So this is how you should parent correctly. Next, he put clinical interventions, so screening for high blood pressure or high cholesterol or diabetes. And in violence prevention, I would put things like screening parents of young children for um, partner violence, for substance abuse, for mental illness or financial stress. In the middle, he put long-lasting protective interventions, so think immunizations. And in violence prevention, I would put home visitation programs that have long-term effects like the Nurse Family Partnership um, that has effects into adolescence on youth violence and substance abuse. And where we really start getting into the policy arena is in this next level where he called it changing the context to make individuals default decisions the healthy decisions. So think fluoride in your water and iodine in your salt. In violence prevention, the closest I could think of was something like um, eliminating access to lethal means to prevent suicides. And at the very bottom, with the largest impact on population level health and the least individual level effort, he put socioeconomic factors. So things like livable wages and affordable housing and tax credits like the earned income tax credit. When I saw this triangle, he calls it a pyramid, but in, even in the paper, it's just a triangle. <laughs> um, I remember thinking, I know this, I learned this back in 1982 when I was studying public health. And so I couldn't understand why, with the 20 years that I had been working in violence prevention, I had been pulled into that top triangle. At the time, I was helping to evaluate two statewide abusive head trauma prevention trials where the intervention consisted of a 10 to 11 minute intervention, which was bedside teaching for new parents, uh, talking to them about infant crying and not shaking the baby. And years later, we found out that it didn't work. Surprise. Um, so this, of course, led me to start looking for policies that affected these socioeconomic factors. In addition to uh, policy being a major driver of population level uh, health, Another reason why we should be looking at policies is because public health, at least those of us who work in the public health sector, uh, as defined by the Institute of Medicine back in 1988, is what we as a society do collectively to assure the conditions in which people can be healthy. What is what we do collectively as a society, if not policy? In addition, if you're not convinced yet that policy is what we should be looking at in public health, uh, policy development and the evaluation of their effectiveness are essential public health functions. So in our effort to um, develop recommendations around different policies and uh, other interventions, we developed what we call technical packages. And this is just um, reviewing the best available evidence to provide some guidance 
to communities and health departments on what we could be doing around, um, for example, child abuse and neglect. And we have these technical packages also for our other areas of violence, so for youth violence, for suicide, for partner violence, and sexual violence. So the Healthcare Utilization Project is really a family of seven different databases, and it also has some software tools, and it's supported by the Agency for Health Care Research Quality. Um, they derive the, their data from administrative data, and it has encounter levels, so hospital encounters or emergency department count encounters, and it includes clinical and non-clinical information um, with all listed diagnoses and procedures, discharge status, patient demographics, and charges for all patients, and the payer. The payer is what we have been using as our socioeconomic um, status proxy. It is um, nationally represented, representative if you use the weights that are provided by AHRQ. And the state's data are um, all encounters, so it's not a sample, it's all the population. And the website is at the very bottom. At the national level, there's an inpatient database, um, there's an inpatient database for, um, specifically for children. There's an emergency department database, and there's a readmissions database. And then at the state level, again, there's a hospitalization inpatient database. There's an ambulatory surgical database, and there's an emergency department database. And as in all data, um, there are some advantages and disadvantages. Uh, some of the main advantages are that these data are available since 1988, and last look, the 2017 data were also available. So especially for policy evaluation, having this long series uh, is really key. Um, it's also a very large um, sample size, or, 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 or all the sample in, in, for state's data, and so it's really great when you're looking at rare outcomes. It's relatively easy access. You just do a brief training, you sign the data use agreement, and then you order it online, and it's de-identified, so it's often exempt from IRB. But the disadvantages are that it's not all states make their data available and not available for every single year. Not all data elements are available in every state. It, the, there are no deaths included here, and so you can't generate like an overall estimate. You would have to get your death data elsewhere and you wouldn't be able to combine it with the hospitalization or emergency department data because you have de-identified data, so you can't link them. The cost varies from $35 to over $3,000, and that uh, varies by state per year, and it depends on whether you're a student, a nonprofit, or a for-profit. And then the most critical disadvantage that I have found in, in using these data is that you really need a very sensitive ICD code. That's the International Classification of Diseases Code for your outcome, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. So a little bit about the Earned Income Tax Credit for those who are unfamiliar with it. Um, it was enacted, it, it, this is the Federal Earned Income Tax Credit enacted in 1975, and it's one of those rare pieces of, of legislation that has bipartisan support because it requires work, income from work, and it also lifts millions of families out of poverty. It varies by whether you're married or single, and the number of children. So it especially benefits families with children. So just to give you an idea of um, how big a credit, if you were married and you had three children, you would get about $6,000 if you were earning between $13,650 to $17,830. So it has a gradual uh, increase as you earn more income, and then it plateaus, and there's a gradual decrease with the more income that you're earning. So another benefit of this policy is that it doesn't have what they call cliff effects, so it doesn't abruptly stop, so it works that way. So, um, we looked at states earned income tax credit, and right now there are 29 states and the District of Columbia that have an earned income tax credit. And it's usually um, a percentage of the federal credit, and it varies whether it's refundable or not refundable. So when we looked at, in this study, the amount that a family would get with a refundable credit, we saw that the tax refund would range from 108 to 1,014 with an average of 418 for a single parent working full-time at minimum wage with one child, and from 165 to almost 1,700 for a single parent working full-time with two children. In states with a non-refundable earned income tax credit, and um, just to give you an idea of how this functions, if you don't owe taxes, you wouldn't get anything because it's, it's not refundable, it's just 
uh, the savings you get on your taxes. So the savings would range from $2 to 189 uh, with an average of $90 for a single parent working full-time at minimum wage with one child, and from zero to 250 for a single parent working full-time with two children. So you can see that the refundable earned income tax credit is much more generous than the non-refundable. So in our study, um, we used ICD codes for abusive head trauma because the child abuse and neglect ICD codes are just not sensitive enough. If you use those codes, you would capture a, between 15% in ambulatory care to maybe 33% in um, death certificates. So not very good codes, and especially it varies by state and it varies by year. But CDC invested quite a bit of time and money in developing or identifying um, ICD codes that were sensitive for abusive head trauma precisely to evaluate those two statewide abusive head trauma trials. And so those codes are 92% sensitive. That means they identify 92% of the cases. We used a difference in difference analysis of states' annual abusive head trauma hospitalization rates in children under the age of two among states with and without a state earned income tax credit. And we controlled for the percent of non-Latino whites, the percent of population above the age of 25 who had graduated from high school, states' yearly unemployment rates, and uh, child poverty rates by year. And what we found was that states that had refundable earned income tax credits, there was a marginal association with a decrease of 3.1 abusive head trauma admissions per 100,000 children under the age of two. And that's equivalent to about a 13% reduction. And that's even after controlling for poverty, unemployment, high school graduation, and race ethnicity. On the other hand, a non-refundable earned income tax credit was not associated with reductions in abusive head trauma. So the first question I always get about the study is, how could that be? What does the tax credit have to do with abusive head trauma? And so there's several mechanisms, and I've already mentioned one, the reduction in poverty. And especially for such a prevalent risk factor, um, it, it really creates a, um, a population level impact. But some other mechanisms, mechanisms are that the earned income tax credit in other studies have been associated with decreased parental stress and mental health problems. And we know that that is a risk factor for abuse and neglect. We also think that decreased stress from um, having more income may also lead to a decrease in dysfunctional modes of coping, like substance use or abuse. And that is another risk factor for child abuse. Increased income could help parents purchase better childcare arrangements or prevent mothers repartnering with someone who's not the child's biological father. And so other studies have shown that when uh, mothers have more income, they don't repartner with an, uh, a child's biological father. And we know that from other studies that the main perpetrator of abusive head trauma is mother's male partner. And then finally, increased income could reduce cognitive load. So the studies on cognitive load and overload show that it really has an effect on the way we process information and on our impulse control. So increased income could reduce that cognitive load and improve the processing of information and cognitions that are related to social stimuli. So one of the main triggers of abusive head trauma is infant crying. So the way the parent uh, interprets that could be very different if they have a reduced cognitive load. So in conclusion, um, the earned income tax credit lifts millions of families out of poverty, especially uh, families with children. And this age cup data allowed us to answer a very straightforward research question and suggested the earned income tax credit potential impact on the prevention of serious abuse of head trauma and other forms of violence perpetrated against young children. So I did want to point you to other studies and I didn't want to um, just point you to the other study that we did. Um, so I included another two to kind of uh, to simulate. Um, but these, there are other studies. If you go to the HCUB website, you'll see the list of studies that have used HCUB data, uh, including our study, which looked at California's paid family leave. And I think that's it. So thank you. <laughs>